this is Derek Karp, the founder and chairman of CSA and the host of the CSA podcast show. And I'm super excited about my guest today on the show. Uh, this is a person I've had the pleasure of knowing for a while, but many, many people in the industry know Eric Byers uh, for reasons that we will get into. But Eric is a definitely a technologist, which will become clear if you don't know him already. But he's an author. He's an inventor. He's an outdoor enthusiast, sailor, skier, a number of things. Uh, he is definitely an entrepreneur, uh, which is always near and dear to my heart because that's sort of my background as well. You know, with no further ado, welcome to the show, Eric Byers. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I know we we will end up there, but you are currently the founder again of a company of Adolis. You're the chief technology officer and and founder, and that's something a theme that we will talk about that is part of your story arc already. So you didn't start out that way, but you've you've done that along the way, and I'll be eager to sort of pull that out of you where um, where the first one was born. Let's go back. I always say that um, modern day cybersecurity people are um, sort of a superhero type, and superheroes always have backstories. Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in uh, North Vancouver, so on the North Shore of, of Vancouver, British Columbia. You're still living in Canada. Did you live? I mean, we'll jump around, but did you did you live at any length of time anywhere uh, anywhere around the world? You know, I ended up getting transferred out to places for long periods of time. I ended up in Australia for um, almost uh, half a year. I ended up in the prairies for a long time. Um, and of course, I've spent a lot of my life in the U.S., but I've always called uh, Vancouver or Vancouver Island home. Okay, awesome. Well, I have not yet been to Vancouver, and so I'm going to need to uh, fix that and uh, make sure that it's a time that you're there. <laughs> yeah, pick a good time of year. It's uh, it's it's definitely worth the trip. I've heard. I've heard. Show you around. Yeah. Sounds sounds great. So I always like to ask Eric, is I think it's sort of interesting what work, you know, and I use that term loosely as a young person, you know, did, you know, did you do first if, you know, what, what kinds of things as young people, people did sometimes it's mowing lawns. Other times people worked in their dad's plant. You know, I, I had that really my uncle's manufacturing plant recently, you know, so there's industrial control systems at age 15. What did you do? Anything like that as a young person? My very first job was around eight years old. Um, I really like root beer. And so my dad showed me how to make root beer. We bought some garbage cans. We made root beer in bulk. And I started the Ruby Lake Root Beer Company, where I sold root beer by getting in at our, at our family cottage on a lake. And I would basically drive around the lake selling cases of root beer to all the neighbors. And, and uh, it was a real lesson because my father made me keep books at eight years old. And, uh, you know, of course, I learned about formulas and how to measure stuff. I mean, it was profitable to me. But I'm sure my dad spent a ton of money on gas because he never charged me for gas. Yeah, right. So the total um, uh, cost of goods sold, you know, wasn't being calculated. But what a treasure trove of uh, of experience. I mean, I, oh, it was I think, amazing. Yeah, it it was really amazing. And my father, uh, about 40 years later, gave me the books that I had kept. It, it, oh. it, I mean, it was a riot. Like all the it was a, it was your classic. Uh, he had made me do sort of classic uh, accounting principles, uh, so it was just it was just a one of those student notebooks, but full of lines. So, oh, what a gift! I mean, uh, you know that plants a seed for me. You know, there's the age-old question: Are entrepreneurs made or born? I think you know there's quotients of of of, of uh, risk taking that we have differently as human beings, but so, clearly there's some made aspect to it. Your father yeah. gave you a huge gift. It was a huge gift, and I mean, we did this a lot, and I mean, I just came to love inventing something or making something yeah. and selling it. And um, and it was almost the social aspects. Being able to zoom around the lake uh, in my dad's boat was sort of uh, like, this is what entrepreneurship will be like. You get to go out and do, do fun things and go visit things and go traveling. You know, five miles is a long way for an eight-year-old. So Yeah. I can see this now because craft food products are so popular now. It's this is your origin story. Then there's all this technology and I, I, I'm just waiting. I'm going to see it in social media, like Eric Byers, magical root beer elixir. Like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to go back to the food. It would be fun. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have to ask, though, just this this part of your story is so, for me so compelling. Have you made a batch of that any time in recent history? No, absolutely not. I have. My whole family has either professionally or um, for fun been in the brewing industry, uh, but not root beer. Always yeah. beer. So. Um, my brothers, yeah, have been heavily involved in the commercial brewing industry, and I've always dabbled around in it, usually making a mess of their batches. Yeah, well, I love it. I love it. Any any intersection or when does technology of any sort intersect with your life? Well, um, that was another thing that my father did. Um, he was a super skilled uh, professional engineer working in the food industry, 
And he bought me, also around the same age, something called a Digicomp One. I don't know if anybody out there has ever seen it. It's a truly mechanical digital computer um, with three bits of memory. Yeah, so not bytes, kids, it's bits. And you've made it out of plastic. Google it. It's fun. I don't think I ever understood it then, and I'm not even sure I understand how it works now. <laughs> I love it. That's cool. Well, okay, so another another early introduction. And uh, and you go on to pursue schooling and you become an engineer. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and I, dre I dreaded it. I, I absolutely wasn't going to be an engineer like my dad. But every course at university yeah. that interested me was in the engineering department. So eventually I threw in the towel and became an engineer. You know, but when you're 18, you don't want to be like your dad. Yeah. So where where was school and what did you what did you degree in? So I uh, got a degree in a Bachelor of Applied Science, which is um, the way into being a professional engineer. And I actually focused on um, geological engineering and mining operations. Hmm. Strangely enough, because they had a better computer budget than anybody else. And I thought computers were a riot. So, so I ended up working. And also, you got to go hiking in really neat places all summer. So I'd, I'd spend my summers out in the bush. Uh, and that was really fun for me. But I, well, I didn't stay there very long in the mining business. Well, yeah. Well, so that's perfect segue because I was going to ask you. So, what'd you go into into first? I think you went international right away, didn't you? Yeah, I ended up working for um, quite a prestigious um, small consulting firm that designed mines, and uh, they shipped me off to Australia, and I lived out in the bush in far north Queensland, and then they shipped me off to um, uh, South Africa, which at that point was in the middle of the uh, troubles that it was having, and and then they shipped me off to Colombia where people were getting killed and it was like crazyville. So they they so I had a couple of years of of going out to really dangerous places. And after a couple of years I decided that was that. I was out of the mining business not because I was going to get killed, but they never had mines in in nice places. They didn't have mines in say New York City or or uh, San Francisco. And also, you know, there weren't that many girls around those places. It was mostly crazy people and uh it was it was rough going so i got out of mining after about three or four years and got more embedded right into the computer market industrial at this point or traditional sort of it stuff uh no it was industrial and data comms when i was out in the mines data comms you know the mines are really scattered and spread out and um you can't just phone the phone company so um i ended up spending a lot of time fixing data comms problems between in the computer systems we were in Colombia, for example, and there was this mine uh, called El Sarajón that was way out in the bush, maybe 150 kilometers. And down on the port, there was where they shipped the coal out. And we were building this uh, tire tracking system and the trucks would drive back and forth and wear the tires out. And sometimes they'd get changed down on the coast and sometimes up in the mine. And the challenge was we needed like this integrated system. And of course, without data comms, that didn't happen. So I spent a lot of time in data comms. Uh, in my mining days. And then I ended up working quite a bit in sort of data communications issues. And then then eventually ended up in uh, working for some automation companies that focused on uh, basically industrial automation. Well, you you will definitely, you are definitely uh, entitled to the pioneer title. You know, I, I sort of, few of you that have been on the show are really in the category. I mean, a anybody who's working in cybersecurity for control systems, even for 20 years, is is a pioneer, but you know, with the formative years that some of you have in control systems and technology, and we get to security, which we'll talk about. Um, those are, I mean, you can't be any more pioneering than than that. Yeah, I think I was pretty lucky to be able to play around with data communications equipment back when it was really, really crazy glued together. You know, remember that movie? I think it was called Independence Day, where the the aliens are coming and the guys hack into the the spaceship. And yeah. I remember seeing that at the time, and I had just spent like six months trying to get two control systems to talk it, to each other. And I remember saying, bullshit, you can't even get, you you couldn't even pay the aliens to connect. Um, <laughs> you know, that would be a one-year communications project, never mind a hacking project. Now the world's changed in hacking, and yeah. communication systems have been a little more standardized, and we now have, you know, things that you know how to hack like TCP IP. But, but, you know, my early days weren't about trying to stop people from getting in, but just trying to get that Honeywell to talk to that Siemens box over there. And, and that was just a hair pulling exercise for years. It's a funny disposition, right? It's like those things were inclined to not work, let alone yes. be hackable. Yeah. 
to not connect, to not have good communication. It was just a challenge to get them to talk at all, let alone for nefarious purposes. Yeah, 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 that's right. I mean, uh, if some hacker had, had hacked into one of our con early control systems, we'd have paid him as a consultant. I mean, yeah, I know, how did you get really anything out of this, this brick? <laughs> Uh, so I spent a lot of time troubleshooting, uh, tearing things apart. And I had some really cool people that I work with. I'm Marty Edwards, for example. Marty wow. still curses me for places I send him to work on uh, sour gas plants in, in northern Canada in the middle of uh, December, you know, uh, to try and fix communications problems. But really, my focus was to try to make it work, not stop people yeah. from it. Yeah, I think, you know, I interviewed Marty for this same show um, quite a while ago. And um, he invoked you on that show. It's sort of his story, I believe. So yeah, I, 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 I that that triggered a triggered a memory. So now I want to know you're you're doing all this stuff. It all makes sense for uh, your career path and where you are ended up. But you went to work for the band ABBA. Uh, well, no, uh, I just had a boss who was an, a huge ABBA fan, and he had a classic systems integrator shop. And so I ended up um, working for a company called ABBA, but it had nothing to do with Sweden, and oh. there were. And we none of us could carry a tune. All right, all right. Uh, maybe you would bust out of the, you were the industrial dancing queen or something like that. But <laughs> um, I don't know. You've seen my shark moves at S four. No, my dancing is not going to get me. Uh, <laughs> I, I just need to stick to my day job. Well, luckily, this is not a variety show. I mean, I'm thinking of launching one, but uh, we won't. We won't go into that. Okay, so the, you know, the, clearly, the industrial part of your your um, the underpinnings of your career, it's 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 evident in, in things you continue to do. I am curious where security even comes up. I mean, I, I know full well that there's many, many years of industrial networking and security is not even something that any of you talked about. But where where does it pop up for you? It, it popped up in two ways. One, I don't know if you, I'm sure you remember Cliff Stoll's book, The Cuckoo Egg. And that I read that while I was a controls engineer and started to really get interested. And again, it's it's about making protocol analyzers out of um, old line printers and stuff like that, like crazy, crazy crap. And and the things he did because people were hacking into systems, he was. So that was sort of my first awakening that, hey, there could be a problem coming down the pipe. But what actually really drove me into the secure, the whole security market was that we had a client. At this point, I was, um, I think I was working for Emerson or soon to be working for um Emerson at this point, we had a very large uh, pulp and paper company on the East Coast who had been doing control system uh, design and particularly communications design, and they got hacked. And we later found out that they got hacked by one of their own staff members back at headquarters. But it really, they, and they didn't know they'd been hacked and they didn't, and nobody really understood the impact of what happened. But it really got me fascinated. And I, so I started, uh, first of all, figuring out what we could do to protect them, uh, what had gone wrong. Um, and again, it was uh, it was not a malicious hack. It was some, um, you know, a well-meaning, stupid thing. I mean, basically, what happened is some guy at headquarters thought it would be useful for a project he was working on to log in, work his way right into the base control system, and start loading code into an an old Foxboro AI uh, system, and that started to you know systematically crash the platform. So not malicious, but it it really made me aware of the risks and. From then on, I just really started to, that started to be a big focus for me. How do you make sure that the right people are logged into that control system? Are you sort of dual path? As some guests have been, I've got into engineering responsibilities. Oh, and I've got some cyber tact on. And then some of you become wholly cyber cybersecurity focused at some point. What's that look like? Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean originally it, I, I was completely on communications engineering. You know, how do you keep these darn boxes talking in a reliable manner? And it wasn't until I ended up at uh, the British Columbia Institute of Technology that I started to actually move away from doing traditional control systems and cyber and uh, communications engineering and say, hey, let's focus on on cybersecurity. Um, and that was again, that was just a series of fortuitous events that sort of drove me in into the uh, yeah. security side of the house. So that's got, I mean, you went there um, in mid 2000s. So you've got 22 years of cybersecurity really dominating your life. And then 10, 10 or more years of engineering before that. Yeah, I would say almost 25. Um, that hack happened in, I think it was uh, uh, 1989, that okay. system got hacked. And and uh, it actually had a whole, I mean, there's a little funny story that goes along with this. Is It was when I was at BCIT, I was not going to work on cybersecurity. I was going to work on um, a quality of service, um, which is 
uh, how do you make sure the packets arrive when they're supposed to arrive and, yeah. and what packets get priority? And that was my area of focus at BCIT. And then 9-11 happened. And because of that hack of that control system in the East Coast pulp mill, I had written a paper for the IEEE on cybersecurity for control systems. Well, if you did a peer review uh, search for literature on control system security uh, when 9-11 happened, you'd get two names, me and Joe Weiss. That was it. Yeah. And m my paper was like, you know, is a, a proper peer reviewed paper. And suddenly people started phoning me at BCIT saying, hey, uh, we want you to focus on cybersecurity. It was an amazing experience because um, I had a lab with two uh, assistant researchers. Uh, the week before 9-11, I had 14 six months later. What an inflection point. It's funny, the last guest on talked about his career inflection point to be mostly focused on cyber versus broader industrial things, 9-11. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big milestone for so many of you. Okay, so, and then BCIT, you were you, sort of the research, you were in charge of a research function and you were there for six years doing different projects. And if I'm not mistaken, you're sort of, jump to entrepreneurship again after root beer is is born there. I had a couple of other jumps um, because um, I had a firm that uh, basically did data communications design for people putting in control systems. So I'd had some entrepreneurship there. I, I Of course, I'd had the lawn mowing businesses like that. And then strangely enough, I also got into uh, property management for rental accommodation and ran rental accommodations okay. at one point. So I'd had a yeah. whole bunch of things. But BCIT was fascinating because with 14 full-time researchers on your staff, you start to get a lot of really cool ideas bubbling up around the, the water cooler. And by the time I left there, there was six or seven really exciting pieces of intellectual property, which became all sorts of different things. Like it became Tofino. It became what became the GE uh, Achilles product. It became... Uh, the basis for um, a whole bunch of modeling that uh, one of the uh, U.S. consulting firms out of there um, do for uh, cybersecurity. So there's a lots of really cool IP that came out of BCIT. I just happened yeah. to follow follow the Tofino path. And, and that's obviously what we're going to talk about next. I think we could do, and maybe we should sometime do a, um, a just a podcast session with you and me talking about just just the Tofino story, because. I don't know how many cybersecurity products focused on industrial control systems, pure play, new company. Are there many that predate uh, Tofino? There was probably one or two that I can think of. Um, and interestingly enough, Industrial Defender was uh, before Tofino. Okay. And they were, yeah. Uh, and uh, I can't remember what they were called. They weren't called Industrial Defender. Yeah. Then. So there were a few pure play uh, companies in there was a German company, but there, there wasn't many in in this space. Well, starting one um, uh, myself more than ten years later, which you know you were one of our advisors. I think how early you were, and I'm in awe of it. I mean, uh, you know, more than a decade later, we will st we were still early as well. You were um, <laughs> pyramids were were being built um, when when you guys were going after Tofino. So I just I think it's an interesting. We should do a session on it because just how all that came to be and. And it wasn't, I don't think, you know, like, oh, it's the success out of the box. But so you're working at, at BCIT, you're, you know, you've got the research group growing and, you're, and some really intelligent people. Tofino, how does Tofino get, get born out of that? I think we do need to touch on it now. One of the things that happens at colleges and university is um, the boards change and they have different sort of different things they want to do to show that, especially a, a state or um, provincial university. And so there was a move at BCIT in about 2005, 2006 uh, to really show that BCIT was uh, creating jobs in the community. And so there was a lot of encouragement for anybody in the, any of the research groups to start to make companies. And so at that time, um, I left BCIT, bought all the intellectual property, actually initially went out and was going to form World Tech and uh, yep. use that intellectual property and then focused on Tofino because I thought it was a more exciting opportunity. So it was literally, okay, here's all the IP. Um, I can buy it off you guys. I'm going to start a company, get some funding and off we go. And, uh, you know, it's hard to summarize that whole, you know, that's another five years before even more years with its acquirer. Um, you know, all told, you probably have a decade of your life in that, in that absolutely. story, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. In fact, it, it was, yeah, it was a decade. 
Yeah, that's what I figured. Sort of when you were still at BCIT, sort of the formative stuff, then its pure years, and then the the Belden years, which bought it. That all together, that's got to be a decade of uh, of journey throughout that yes. whole thing. I think we could unpack that separately. What what would you, if you had to, you know, thinking about some of the what we try to accomplish in these sessions, if you had to go back. What was a you know a, a challenge that you remember uniquely and how you navigated it or how you would have navigated it differently that people listeners who might be thinking about starting a company uh, you know in this space you know we do have people attending our sessions and, and listening to the podcast that you're in that category you know what might you share with them well first of all um, you'll never believe how slow things move I I mean I just you know very early on in the tofino story we had just left the university i was at a conference i think it was an isa conference a fairly senior executive from one of the big oil companies approached me and said this is the product we need and not only that i'm going to walk you down to um uh, the supplier that we like to use called honeywell and you you and them are going to work together to produce this product for us and i went wow you know i wonder if i should get my porsche now or later <laughs> we made it yeah exactly yeah. I did not get a, an order out of that for four years. And, yeah. and it wasn't, it was just that things, particularly in our space, it always takes a long time in any, any space. It's always slower. But, you know, the control system world moves glacially. And it's, it's just a history of making sure you're doing the right thing before you jump because, you know, you can carve a big hole in the ground. So, yes. you know, looking back, I should have um, planned getting a lot more money and it's going to take a lot more time to keep all my staff around and to you know go from building a product, getting the product on the market, getting it approved by a large oil company and then getting it ordered in bulk is a 5-year project. Maybe you're lucky you can do it in 3, but you know it will not happen in a year. Well, Eric, uh, you know, I am uniquely qualified to say that's a gold <laughs> nugget. That is truth speaking uh, right there. I, I think, and that, and that's still some parameters change, but there's real truth there still today. If you were doing something, and so I think any of our listeners who are contemplating or in the midst or already launching something or have a startup, that concept of double the budget, double the time that it's going to take is probably still a, an axiom, you know, that people should organize around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, and I think there's another lesson, um, and that is. You never really know what you're building until your customers start to buy that. I mean, the Tofino went through so many iterations, me thinking I knew what my customers wanted, and then actually delivering a product, and then people saying, oh, that's really cool, but I wanted it to do X. Um, and yet, at the same time, there's this, people will ask for things they have no intention of ever purchasing. Your customer doesn't always know what they want, and often has no clue what they want, but be prepared to change what you're building all the time. Yeah, that I think that's another truth. There's a, a number or many case studies I think of. We started here and we ended up there. And so I, I think that the quest there is how attuned are you to new data and information? How quickly can you make a change? Because that's not trivial. That that can be very challenging. That can put a company and startup out of business. You know, like not changing quick enough or changing too many times. It, there's a whole chessboard there that we could unpack. We don't have time today. But what you said is crucial, but not necessarily easy. No, no. But it is the advantage. This is why startups work is they can change on a dime where, you know, yeah. a large a large company, a Fortune 500 company will be th still studying it three years from now. And you can make a decision on a weekend. Hey, guys, yeah, we're no longer. And, and sometimes the decisions, you know, for example, one of the things that we really thought the market needed was a good VPN product. And it just it just brought tears to our eyes every time we tried to roll one out. And eventually, I remember after spending a lot of investors' money on trying to make Tofino a really good VPN, we just finally said, nah, forget it. We're just, it's not the, it's not our market. We're building firewalls. Yeah. Yeah. So give a quick uh, explanation about the Tofino firewall. So people who may not, you know, familiar, or they've heard the term, but don't, don't, you know, it's not clear in their mind what it was, is, you know, what, what, what you still know, is, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a little firewall. I wish I had one to show you. Um, both the size of about, oh, I, I'd say like three commemorative CD um, packs, if you still remember CDs, um, you know, sort of stuck together, sort of that big and designed to, be, it's a firewall designed to be used in industrial systems. Um, it's hardened. That was the easy part, but it is designed to do two things. And one was to act like a switch, not like a firewall. In other words, what, it's what we call a layer two device because it made it easy for technicians to put in. And second, uh, to really understand the entire protocol stack of the of the 
uh, control system traffic that was going through, you know, to understand, hey, yeah, that's Modbus. And now every firewall can say, hey, yeah, that's Modbus. But hey, that's a Modbus read command coming from this device over here, reading to this area or writing to this area, or it's a Modbus program. And, and it's what we call a full stack firewall. And what I'm most proud about, it, uh, uh, well, there's two things actually I'm really proud about it. One is you go and you buy a Honeywell firewall today or a Schneider electric firewall or a Caterpillar firewall or an Invensys firewall. That's my team's technology inside. You know, the, the guys just built something that everybody could use. So I was, I'm really proud of that. That is cool. So it's, it's DNA is out there in so many. Everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, and it just keeps on uh, living on. You know, people come to me all the time and say, hey, yeah, we put in, you know, 50 Schneider Tofino firewalls in our plant. And man, it's been great. And, you know, I had nothing to do with that. That, that, it, that was long after I sent that kid off to school. It's, that's, it's a cool, that. that's a cool legacy. That's a fun yeah, feeling. Yeah. I, there are, I have all kinds of guests. This and, of course, you are much, you and I have some <laughs> career path things that just make this, uh, for me, uh, you know, very meaningful. I I, I get that. And th that's a fun thing to see. You know, my first startup, the one that Mike Asante and I started in 1997, 20 years later, I, you know, I had visited it a few times and we sold it, you know, four or five years after we founded it. I went, you know, 20 years later, I went and toured the facility and one of our employees, like our 12th employee, I think, you know, he was in charge of it still. And Cisco System was running it in the same, well, part of the same building. I think they moved to a different building, but same city you know, in the Midwest and, you know, in the suburb of Columbus, Ohio. And they're like, yeah, there's four of us still here from the original team. And that's wow. a really, really amazing feeling, even though, yeah, personally touching it's been, you know, it's been many, many over a decade, uh, maybe 15 years since personally touching anything there. But, but yeah, it, it's sort of a stamp of like, oh, there was, this was valuable versus flash in the pan stuff. That's like, oh, well, it looked really great, but you know, nowhere to be seen anymore. So that's a cool milestone that you achieved that. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I am. It's still, I, it may be the most widely deployed firewall in the world uh, for control systems. For control systems, yeah. Well, that's cool, and and uh, and is is probably the the number one thing that people people associate with you, even though you've touched a, a lot of things and and regulations yeah. and standard bodies, and you've you've touched a lot of those too. You stayed with Belden for I don't know three and a half years or something, which is longer than many founders stay yeah. with an acquirer. Any any sort of comments on that period of your life? That was a bit tricky for me. Um, you know, Belden, Belden was a good company. Um, I have no complaints, but um, I'm not sure I'm a big company uh, chief security officer uh, or chief technology officer. Uh, you know, somebody said, hey, wouldn't it be great if your latest company, um, you know, become a publicly traded company? I am not really sure that that's my uh, love in life. I, I like... I like being, you know, entrepreneurial. I like being the mammal around the dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah, I, I do know where you're coming from. Um, so you went on then, uh, and you did finally uh, eventually leave there, and you became a senior partner at ICS Secure, um, also yeah. out of Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. Any any comment on on that period of your? Yeah, you know? that was really fun. I mean, uh, the whole purpose of ICS Secure was to basically do advisory services. So we did a lot of M and A consulting for. Is IT companies that wanted to buy a company in the OT space. We did lots of advisory services for engineering companies interested in cyber, you know, should they get in the cybersecurity market? We did um, advisory services for uh, companies who were startups. I mean, I think that's how I ended up working with your previous group is I think it was through ICS Secure. So I was, it was a really fun time to go out and advise people and and coach people. And I still, I still am there. I still do a, li a little bit of uh, sort of analysis and consulting for people, but it's okay. only, you know, 5% of my uh, week. And it's hard to compress uh, as long uh, of a story of yours into the time frame we've got, but you know, you, you're also an advisor to many companies, some of our other amazing sponsors, including your company. Thank you very much. I should have acknowledged that at the beginning, Adolis, your baby now is uh, a, a supporting, uh, very active supporting partner of CSA. But you're on Verve's uh, advisory board, and Verve's one of our partners. And I mean, it's just coincidental. I was looking at your sort of resume. Uh, uh, the Nexus is one of yeah. our uh, newest uh, partners. So anyway, clearly that's a, a role that you also do uh, here and there in the industry is with other companies on an advisoral nature. And uh, so, you know, I always like to ask, and I think your career path is going to lend itself to this, uh, you know, because you're currently our advisor to a number of companies. Some of them are are sponsors also of uh, of CSA, just like your company, Adolis, is. And you know, we're grateful to that, by the way. Thank you. 
but Verve and Denexus are also supporting our workforce development efforts. Um, you're, you're on uh, their advisory boards and Bayshore Networks advisory board. So just as far as advisor and mentor, mentee, uh, maybe that's been a role too that you've had been the beneficiary of it. What Can you talk about that that part of your, your career path, either these former roles or just earlier, uh, more formative stages of your career? You know, what what role has mentorship and it, and then today being an advisor, what does that play in your in your life? Well, I mean, when you're starting up, the mentorship is invaluable. You know, people, um, you know, people I can think of. Um, my father was an amazing mentor to me, um, you know, a professional engineer, very, very skilled. Um, people like Frank Williams, who, along with Jim Pinto, formed Actions Inter- Instruments back in the 80s. These guys have been amazing and sort of just coaching me through You know, it's often little things like watching Frank Williams deal with adversity and deal with messes and just watch him being so calm. And so, you know, it's often it's not like, you know, invest here or do that. It's more like role modeling. Like this is the way you can handle a real mess up, you know, as a person, not not as not, you know, without. So I've had a whole bunch of people. Those are two of them. You know, other people I can think of is my boss at BCIT, Paul Teal. Again, absolutely amazing mentor. And he had come out of a bunch of startups and just, yeah, just helped me sort of get, stay grounded, I would say that. that that's, if I was to summarize what mentors really do, is that they help the people they're mentoring get grounded and figure out what they really want to do. And, and I find, I, you know, maybe other communities are equally like ours. I don't know. I only really know our industry and, and the cybersecurity industry, I guess, more formatively broadly. It just seems there's a lot of people willing to give mentorship. I, I've always felt that way. And everybody, every guest has been like you, has been like, yep, giving and receiving. I mean, big part of path and journey. Yeah, I think it's my job um, as the chief um, technology officer now at my company now. Um, I don't see myself as a boss, more of a mentor for my teams. Uh, I've got 20 some odd people here work for me uh, directly on technology. And the most important thing to me is, um, are they making good career moves? Are they developing? Are they learning? Are they, are you know, they're working on a part of a project or a, say a data science project for me. Um, you know, is this going to be something that helps them along their path? That to me is actually the really important part is I, I'm wanting to look out for them as they're looking out for the company. Well, that's a good segue. I, I think let's talk about uh, Adolis and, and your current passions. Let's talk about uh, cybersecurity for uh, for software and, and supply chain. You know, it's a big issue. Obviously, last year showed us some some uh, pivotal moments uh, in the industry. So, you know, how did Adolis come to be? And, and um, you know, what what would you share with us about this this area this problem area? Yeah, so um, Adolis, the seeds of Adolis happened in 2014 while I was still at Belden, and that's when um, the Dragonfly attack started to happen. For any of your listeners that aren't familiar with Dragonfly, it was probably a, a Russian driven um, penetration attempt on, against industrial systems that was carried out by attacking suppliers. Uh, trojanizing their software, and then getting the customers to load trojanized software, download it off the website, off the supplier's website, and load it into your control system and and let this havoc run rampant on your control system. And I remember looking at at that while I was um, chief uh, technology officer at Belden, who sell a lot of security products, a lot of comms products, and and thinking, honestly, uh, we don't have anything in our product line that protects that. I was nothing. In fact, I can't look at Cisco's. I can't look at anybody to protect against that sort of uh, supply chain attack. So it really bothered me. And and then later, amusingly enough, I ended up um, doing due diligence on an M&A project for another client um, that looked at one of those victim companies. And I spent a lot of time digging through what went on there. And it's just scared the Jesus out of me. Um, so I wanted to do something around supply chain, but I didn't know what. And then um, uh, Jonathan Butts, who you may know is a re- retired U.S. Air Force um, major um, and had done a lot of cybersecurity work uh, for the U.S. Air Force, uh, approached me um, with my ideas that him and Billy Rios had had, uh, and it was called White Scope. The whole idea was, hey, could we validate what was going on in the software supply chain? And so it was really their initial idea, and I had no intention of doing another startup, but I was so I just felt like this was so needed. Uh, now, this is 2015, 2016, and solar winds hadn't happened. Uh, 
you know, the executive orders hadn't happened, but it was just a feeling like this is going to go bad real fast. Um, and it went fa bad faster than I thought. They you know the need to get on top of what software is buried inside your control system <laughs> just now. I mean, you just can't run a control system without knowing what third party components are kicking around in there. And that's surprising to me that you were looking at it as early as you were, but it is probably now only that it is on a much wider group of individuals in America or in corporations worldwide are thinking about it finally, right? Oh, yeah. It was just, I mean, before I was, uh, I, I was just preaching into the wind. I mean, I just, <laughs> yeah. And and there was a few other people. So um, like put a little box on the corner, on the street corner, uh, yeah. maybe oddly dressed, just sort of like shouting at everybody that went by. Yes, absolutely. That's what it felt like. Um, and, 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 you know, and there were other people, I, I won't claim to be the only guy who was saying, hey, this is going to be a problem. You know, uh, Dr. Alan Friedman, uh, he was standing on his soapbox on his corner. Uh, Josh Gorman was standing on his soapbox. The three of us were all standing on soapboxes. Yeah. Uh, but we were definitely not getting big audiences. And then, you know, to put it bluntly, shit happened. And then we got big audiences. Well, and that's, I mean, you know, that, that, that's a whole interesting theme for entrepreneurs is sometimes those events happen in a time frame that's good. And sometimes you, you don't want society to have an incident, but you, you know, that if it happens, it would be, it was sort of like, say, I'm not just shouting into the wind anymore, you know, and they don't always happen uh, in the time frame you, you need to happen. So that's a bit fortuitous. You don't ever know. Uh, you know, Stuxnet did that to Tofino. Tofino, we were moving along slowly, selling our firewalls, barely staying alive. Joanne and I, you know, were just racking up our visa card to pay mortgage payments and, and just, and then Stuxnet happens in 2011. And suddenly, you know, we just get buried in phone calls and suddenly exactly. security starts to become a, a, a board yeah. level issue. And and so, yeah, it, one of the things I think as a, as a startup person is the environment's going to change. The marketplace is going to change. You just want to be prepared to get on that train when it goes by and you don't know which direction it will be going. But, you know, something will happen that will change the market. And if you if you can move fast enough, you can jump on the train. I was really lucky in both cases that the train was go happened to be going the same direction as the product had been going. So yeah, I that, that's, that's the part that's just, it's, it's sort of magical, right. And hard yeah. to, to yeah. be at the same speed and be able to get the train. <laughs> hey, it's great. It's not crushing me and I'm riding it. We're together. <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome. So talk a little bit more about, uh, about this, sort of supply chain, you know, people, a lot of people, I mean, even me to some degree, we're like, what a, how do we address this? It's so complicated. I've heard uh, people talk about how many different companies are in in sequence to something, you know, that that the end user is using, and it's it's startling to some people. Like, oh, is it two companies? It can be more. And then there's hardware. Obviously, you're focused on software, but there's like, what's inside this box, and what's inside those chips, and what's inside this? You know, it's complicated. How do we even, how, how does this get addressed? Well, I'm going to answer that in two parts. One is unbelievably complex. And every time I look at it, I learn new things. I mean, it is, it is, we find that on average, when we look at a piece of industrial software, be it an HMI or um, logic for a PLC, you know, not logic for a PLC, sorry, firmware for a PLC, the core of a PLC, or, or any, any piece of firmware or software, there's typically about a thousand different third-party components or components buried in there, um, usually from 30 to 40 different suppliers. And Ooh. often it's a uh, supplier to a supplier to a supplier. So it's not just third-party products, it's fourth and fifth-party products. And that's on average. Sometimes I'll tear apart a package and, you know, whoa, there's, uh, you know, 75 different suppliers from all over the world. So it's a complicated mess. But I mean, we said control system security was going to be a complicated mess two decades ago, and yet it has been, but we're starting to get our hands around it. We'll get our, our, our head around it and our hands around this problem over the next few years. Uh, I think the first thing to do is get transparency. If you listen to Dr. Friedman or you listen to anybody, um, knowing what's in the soup is the first is the first step. You got to under. And then the second part is okay. Um, now I know what's inside this box. Here's the, here's the ingredients. Here's where they came from. Is uh, then doing a risk assessment, some sort of rapid risk assessment. Is oh yeah, that software that's coming from this really uh, uh, good company that's got a good reputation. Oh, and there's a pile of software that's coming from a company that I really don't want to be dealing with. And case in point, uh, Ron Brash and I tore apart some RTU software for um, Midwestern Pipeline, 
And I was just messing around in there and suddenly I trip over Huawei. Now, you can take your opinion on whether Huawei is good or a bad company. I, you know, it, it, that's a political question, but I sure didn't expect to find it in the middle of an RTU. Yeah. You know, so somebody needs to stop and think about that. Should I be having Huawei software and components running on my RTU and my pipeline? It, there's no one answer, no right answer, but there is the question of awareness. And that's really what we're going to be seeing over the next few years is trying to figure out what's inside the software and then doing and then making sense of it in a way that's actionable and rapidly and really giving executive boards, you know, the visibility, they, they have to have the visibility into what the heck they're buying and using. It's funny. I'm thinking about, uh, for obvious reasons in our shared history, you know, if we're going to secure industrial systems, first thing is we need to figure out, you know, let's invent, what, what, what assets are there? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. where you start, right? What, what are we dealing with before even more sophisticated solutions emerge, right? Yeah. yeah I think this is this is asset management 2.0 is what this is. Yeah. Hey, we've got a PLC out there. Great. Okay. It's an Allen Bradley uh, Control Logic 1756-L3. Uh, Great. Okay. That's a good start. That's a really good start. Yeah. Now, what's running on it? Yeah. So two years ago or three years ago, maybe even now in some, in many, too many places to admit, just knowing that that's there at that endpoint is great. That was good. That was a good start. <laughs> what about inside? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That, that that makes sense. That makes sense. That the total asset inventory includes a whole bunch of layers, and uh, I love that. I hadn't really thought about it exactly that way. Uh, let's drop a bomb on this. Um, S bombs, D bombs. These terms you're going around. What? I mean, S bombs. I think particular to you. You know, what 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 is this? What does that mean? Well, the concept is really simple. It's what are the ingredients in the box? Think of it as a an ingredients list on the side of your can of soup, and and that is what an S bomb should be. It's an it's a static ingredients on this piece of software. What components are in there and who made them? Software bill of materials, right? Software bill of materials. You can call it all sorts of different names, but the bo bottom line is give me a list of, of software components in this product. And that's the first step. But now where it gets tricky is that, um, well, two things make it tricky. But the first one is just like when you're looking at the can of soup, there's a whole bunch of ingredients that you may not even know what they are. They're just chemical names. Are they good for you? Are they bad for you? Um, you know, when I look, I don't know. I mean, that's the next thing. You got to do a risk analysis once you know the ingredients. So a typical risk analysis I do when I'm looking at a can of soup. Well, uh, my son's fiance is allergic to peanuts. So I am looking for peanuts on that can of soup. You know, other people don't care. Um, so it isn't that, you know, certain ingredients are inherently bad. Some are. But more important is trying to, once you have the idea of, of what you've got there, what's the risk to your organization? And do that in a holistic way. Do a way that the executive office can make sense of that. Yeah, and is, is, is D-bomb, is that VHS Betamax, or it's really just a marketing, it's a different, you know, how different are these sort of terms? So uh, D-bombs, I think, are roughly the same thing, you know. It's a bill of materials, right? That's... It's, it's, all, it's all a bill of materials. D-bombs uh, was Chris Flask's creation. And yeah. it was to look beyond, it was a digital list of bill of materials that would look towards software and hardware. But the one that's really sticking is the one that's in the executive order. It's the the official NTIA, the uh, minimum elements of a, a software bill of materials. That, that's now pretty much become, um, you know, the world standard for here's what, it, here's what you should be getting. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about this. We've got an event together coming up. And I'm excited because we're going to really unpack all this this, this stuff in a in a very specific uh, deep dive, um, which I, I know that the that, that our audience uh, is is craving. Just people are asking, what do these terms mean, and what do we do, and what are the solutions, and how does one even approach this? And and so I'm excited. We're having a whole a whole symposium focused on that. So I, I want to uh, we're going to get to that, and I want to ask you some questions about that. So I think in sort of wrapping up uh, this podcast uh, about you and about your journey and where you ended up. What would you go back if you were sitting down with young Eric Byers, um, having gone through all these uh, things that we barely unpacked any of them? They're all such rich learning experiences. What would you go back and tell young young Eric Byers about this industry or career or career advice? Oh, I, I think it's pretty simple. I would have told young Eric Byers to take a breath. You know, I, 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 I was really tightly wound as a young engineer and then as a young entrepreneur. And that, that was good. I needed the energy. But I think I was really hard on people. I think I was hard on myself. I was hard on the product. And I think it would have been a better product if I'd been a little more or, and a better company. It, it all survived. It all worked. But I, I, I look back and I think um, 
And it is one of the advantages of getting older. She go, you know, pick your battles, Sarah. Um, don't get upset about everything. Pick the things that really matter and focus there. And, you know, I certainly uh, would get uh, got really tightly wound up on some things that I now look back and I thought, wow, that was a waste of my time. Yeah, boy, oh boy, that resonates with me. Yeah. Wait, is that wisdom kicking in eventually? <laughs> what is that? I, I don't know. Or the school of hard knocks? I have no idea. Looking yeah. at yeah, just looking at my way, I spent some of my days and the things I ruined weekends over, and I go, really? Sure. Wow. And and then and then that took me off uh, my my eye off the ball on other things, you know. So I think sure. it's really about that prioritization, and one of the prioritizations is trying to have a life and breathe and see, you know, and and have a chance for your brain to be creative. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I can't help but see that as a segue again to to mentors and advisors. They are people who might give you that perspective. If you're open to it and you've picked well and they have a style that's palatable, there are some people who are like, let me tell you what to do. Well, entrepreneurs are, tend to be, you know, type A personalities, entrepreneur or not, tend to not be sort of be resistant to let me tell you what to do. But if you get the right coach, mentor, advisor, whatever term you want to use, some of that wisdom can be transferred, which is to say that thing you're maybe that you're really, you're really, um, engaged, let's say engaged with, obsessed could be another word, might not be the best return on your time. You know, do you want to talk about that? Could be a yeah. huge return, return on uh, return on that time together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just uh, you know I think back to my mentors and they ask questions. Uh, they always ask questions. They didn't tell me what to do. They they said, oh well, you think that's the best use of your time? Yeah. And 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 if so, you know, tell me why. And sometimes they say, yeah, that makes sense. And sometimes, okay, um, I disagree, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's your business. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, make, makes sense. Um, what are you most excited about? If we just gaze to the future. Um, and I think this is sort of just generically well, you know, what's Eric excited about, but also I like maybe if you if you see an opportunity in bed, we have people entering uh, the workforce who say, hey, boy, if I were, you know, they ask, you know, where would I, where could I focus myself? Is it AI? Is it machine learning? If I want to be, you know, it's easy in hindsight to say, if you start focusing on this 10 years later, you're very valuable. You know, the industry needs you, wants you. There aren't enough people that know what you know. Well, so that takes a little bit of luck or if you were future gazing, and so you might, this might be a two-part answer, what you're excited about, but also if you say, yeah, if somebody wanted to start laying the tracks now to being on the cutting edge of something or being very valuable in industry later, what would the answer to that sort of two-part question be? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, um, just with what I'm working with right now, I'm really excited about the opportunities in data science. Um, you know, back when I had Defino, I did not have data scientists on my team. Now, a third of my team are data scientists. They're actually really, really good engineers and good mathematicians. And, they're, and and what's great is they can get the answers out of the information that we have in a way that's really efficient. A case in point, vulnerability notices are a pain. They're pieces of paper that nobody reads. So one of the projects my data science has been working on is looking for pieces of paper out there, PDF documents, anything out there on the internet with the words vulnerability in them, grabbing them and then scanning them and, and then um, figuring out how to put them into a, a a database so you can say, oh, there's a piece of paper with the words vulnerability, control logic, 1756, and I have a 1756 control logic. Oh, maybe that piece of paper, but I don't want to actually read it. Maybe I could have a, a built-in summary. That's So that kind of really cool things that you can do that, yeah, a human being can do it, but they won't because it's too much work. And and, and I think that's really important. Um, we've got to turn around the security market and the security models we're using and make them less labor intensive and more automated because we just don't keep up to the bad guys. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, do you think, are there, are there if, if someone is, is early in their career path, are there things you talk about data science? Obviously, that's an area someone can get not only formal education, but informal. Is, is, is machine learning and artificial intelligence, like, you know, if you want to be in any aspect of cybersecurity, are those going to play? Are those going to be parts of that? Yeah, I sort of mix AI, data science, and uh, machine learning all into the same bucket at the end of the day. I mean, I realize there are technical differences, which we won't go into here. But, you know, it's this that whole idea of being able to use the data you've got in front of you in an efficient manner, just like a human would if they had all day to read the darn uh, document or study the chart or whatever, uh, and be able to infer, you know, information out of massive amounts of data. And that's what we're facing in security. You know, we're facing, you know, millions of vulnerabilities. We're facing thousands of different products we're facing, you know, thousands of different notices were, you know, the, the you know, I, I was mentioning like every, every piece of software has a thousand different components. 
you're not going to hand hand analyze that. It's just not efficient. So you've yes. got to have the machines do the job for you. And so I'm excited about that. But it's just one technology. I think if I was to tell anybody, the most important thing is the ability to sort of keep your feet in several camps. Um, there was a, a really good um, book, and I'm just forgetting the name of it right now. Darn it. Uh, quite a few years ago, um, that was about like scientific revolution. and you know, you look at somebody like uh, Louis Pasteur. He was not a regular biologist. He he actually, you know, dabbled in other areas. So it's usually the people who are a little outside or the people who have got their foot in several camps and can sort of synthesize a bunch of ideas. So in a way, I was really lucky. I'm a mining engineer. I'm a communications engineer. I'm a systems engineer. And I can borrow bits and pieces from all of those and say, oh, it's time to build a firewall. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Inspiration is born from that sort of that nexus of uh, of, of exposure, right? I mean, I, yeah. I, that that is great, and it also I, I think it's good if we've got you know listeners who are coming from a a background that they think is not you know going to lend it. It's probably a pretty broad group of of backgrounds that can end up in cybersecurity, and you may have to augment your knowledge of some things that weren't part That's of your right. training thus far, but you can bring forward something from what you've been doing. To this discipline, I think. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Mathematicians, various types of science backgrounds, um, certainly IT backgrounds, hardcore engineering, formal engineering backgrounds. Those are all going to make sense. Just bring in the other stuff. If you don't know anything yeah. about cybersecurity, add that to your engineering or your math, uh, your math background. Yeah. But but you've got a, you've got an interesting basis that'll in the modern age of convergence, those are going to those are going to benefit according yeah. to what you're. Saying. It makes sense to me. I mean, I think I've only hired two professional security people on my team. The rest are people that are really good at, at a particular field who really want to learn about security and are willing to get in and get their hands dirty in the security field with all this other cool knowledge. Oh, that's awesome. I love that, that we got around to that comment here at the end because that's that's great. We have a huge shortage of cybersecurity people. And what you just said was, I didn't, they weren't cybersecurity people at all. We're going to make them into them. They, their work is going to make them into them, but they brought other disciplines to the table. Uh, so the modern security force that we're building today will have people who who come from all kinds of backgrounds. I mean, none of us who are, who are, or who are our age went and got a degree in cybersecurity because right. it didn't exist. Right. Uh, you know, none of the guys who wrote the standards had any background in cybersecurity. A few guys had some military security background, but it wasn't cyber. Yeah. Yeah. Makes makes sense. Well, uh, Eric, we've reached the part of the show where I uh, I like to end with the Pivot questionnaire. And so this is, um, I feel like I'm following in good footsteps because I'm borrowing it, but so did the last user of this. So it's it's um, it's from inside the actor studio, which uh, may still be running today. I haven't seen it recently. The, the longtime uh, host of it, James Lipton, did pass away in recent years, but it was uh, on air for decades with him interviewing some of the greatest actors and actresses of our time uh, on stage. And he always ended the show with the Pivot questionnaire, which he borrowed from a French show before that. So I think this might have 50 years in it. And it's word for word, the exact questionnaire that uh, that he borrowed and that he used. So if you're up for it, we'll end the show with, uh, okay. What is your favorite word? Energy. What is your least favorite word? Wine, as in quit whining. What turns you on either creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Creating things. I love building things. What turns you off? Uh, red tape, anchors, uh, anything that sort of is roadblocks. I, if, if I have to say one word, it's, well, maybe it's two, roadblocks. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck. That is the most famous word, or the most favorite uh, featured word, by the way. What sound or noise do you love? You know, I love the sound of uh, skis on snow. I just, it's so, it's just, you know, whether it's out cross-country skiing, wherever, I love the sound of, of skis on snow. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, you know, it's got to be fingernails on the blackboard or uh, small screaming babies on airlines, one of the two. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? You know, I always wanted to be a waiter in a high-class restaurant. I thought that would be really fun. What profession would you not like to do? I definitely wouldn't want to be in a... Well, I mean, there's some obvious ones. I wouldn't want to be a you know garbage collector or anything like that. But, you know, I certainly 
don't want to be an accountant. I don't want to be, uh, yeah, you know, sort of that side of the business house, which is why I'm the CTO and not the CEO anymore. Because I don't, I, well, I love the technology. I love the inventing. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You made a good effort. All right. Thank you, Eric Byers, Chief Technology Officer and Founder and Board Member of Adolis, uh, outdoor enthusiast, inventor, author, sailor, entrepreneur, and absolutely a technologist and one of the pioneers of cybersecurity for control systems. Uh, thank you for everything you do in the industry and, and uh, least of which being on the show. Thanks for that, too. Thank you very much.